Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share some thoughts on Brown Girl in the Ring by Nalo Hopkinson. It's a book I really enjoyed and it's a book that's interesting in part because of the ways that it seems to exist across different genres. On one aspect, it's science fiction. I think Hopkinson is usually classified as a science fiction writer. So that's definitely going on, but it's also filled with Afro-Caribbean tradition. Hopkinson draws on her own culture, her own identity to uh, give us characters who are Afro-Caribbean and, and whose ancestors are Afro-Caribbean living there in this central core of Toronto that's been cut off from the suburbs, sort of this dystopian aspect that brings us back into that science fiction. But the Afro-Caribbean aspects are really interesting. We're not just seeing the religious practices of these, these characters. We're also finding out uh, about different foods they eat, um, different herbs that they use for their own traditional medicine. Uh, the, the language, most of it is written in sort of an Afro-Caribbean dialect. And so there's this wonderful way in which this, this entire novel is introducing readers to Hopkinson's world, Hopkins, Hopkinson's culture, through the vehicle of a science fiction thriller. And so that combination is very, very effective. Um, and I, again, I just, I would really recommend reading any of her works, but certainly this one was one I really enjoyed. Uh, but to get into it, it is dystopian. We're set in the not too distant future. I mentioned that central Toronto has sort of been cut off from the rest of Toronto, the, the suburbs where the businesses have fled, the government has fled. Um, healthcare systems generally have fled. We see that there is this healthcare crisis going on in greater Canada that's an issue that, that loops in with our book. Um, but for the most part, we're, we're just there in Toronto. We're seeing a community that reminded me a little bit of what happens in uh, the film Escape from New York when it's sort of cut off. This, this, the difference is this is not a prison, but it, it seems like a prison for the people who have been trapped there, those who didn't have the money to flee, those often who, who were of um, non-white ethnicities. Uh, and races living there in central Toronto. And so the communities that exist there are interesting. We see that there are sort of barter economies um, in existence, and there are people who are sort of finding a way to make it work. But there's a lot of people who uh, seem to be very desperate, seem to be very hopeless. There's this posse that goes around um, and deals with with a, a drug that that uh, certain characters are, are even addicted to. Um, but we're introduced to Tijian, uh, who's a young woman. She's a, a new mother, and she's living with her grandmother, who is, is sort of a source for much of that Afro-Caribbean tradition. Her grandmother, uh, Mami, or Grosjean, she's able to uh, create little ointments, so even things for something like a foot rash or athlete's foot. She creates so many of these different medicines and, and is, then trades those to other characters in order to get food to survive and run, sort of runs a health clinic. Um, and so that that... There's that sort of aspect to the story, and that in itself would be this interesting story. But then we start to realize that Tijian and her, her grandmother, Grosjean, uh, deal with the Afro-Caribbean deities. And so that component becomes uh, another layer of what's going on. And so I wanted to read a passage just to give a sense of what's going on. Tijian couldn't see her own death or babies. She couldn't see Tony's death, not anyone close to her. And she didn't see cra blind, crazy Betty until the woman was right in front of her. Sightless eyes turned toward Baby, who was snuggled in Tijian's arms, happily gumming the mitten on one tiny fist. That is my child. He's mine, shouted the bag lady. Her wrinkled arms reached to pluck Baby away. What are you doing with my baby? You can't make a child pretty, so you didn't ever want he Give he to me. The old fear of madness made Tijian go cold. She jerked Baby out of Crazy Betty's reach. Alarmed, the child began to wail, mad woman in front of her, hard-eyed men just behind, but at least the men had something behind their eyes, some spark of humanity. Tijian chose. She turned and ran back the way she'd come. Hey, Tijian. Tony reached for her arm. She yanked it away, pushed between Tony and Cropo. She dragged the door open and ran into the roadie shop. The warm, fragrant air on her face was a shock. How come she was outside? And why was it warm? Tijian looked around, then jumped as she felt Tony's hand on her shoulder. Tijian, what's up? You all right? She didn't answer. She appeared to be in a green tropical meadow. A narrow dirt path ran through it, disappearing in the distance as the road curved gently downward. The scent of frangipani blossoms wafted by on a gentle breeze. Baby stopped fussing. A figure came over the rise, leaping and dancing up the path. Man-like, man-tall on long, wobbly legs, look as if they hitch on backward. Red, red all over, red eyes, red hair, nasty pointed red tail, juking up into the air. Face like a grinning African mask, only is not a mask. The lips them moving, and it have real teeth behind them, lips attached to real gums. He waving a stick, and even the stick self paint up red, with some pink and crimson rags hanging from the one end. Is dance he dancing on them wobbly legs? Flapping he, he knees in and out like if he drunk? Jabbing his stick in the air, and now I could hear the beat he moving to, hear the word of the chant. Diab, 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 
Tijian shrank back, trying to hide baby's face from the terrifying sight, but he chortled, chortled and stretched baby fat hands out in the direction of the jab-jab. Tony had more sense. Behind her, she could hear him whisper, God Almighty, what the hell is that? The jab-jab turned its appalling grin of living wood in their direction. It hopped right up to the three of them, split its wooden lips wide, and hissed in their faces. A hot, stiff wind. And so the ways that Tijian and um, we see her grandmother, Groshian, interacting with Afro-Caribbean deities, um, with sort of the visions they have, are, are this whole other world that's going on across Brown Girl in the Ring. And I think it's very effective. Hopkinson does a really nice job of balancing sort of the dystopian aspects of the narrative, this thriller going on around the healthcare crisis. Uh, we know that someone needs a human heart and it's implied pretty yeah, early on in the first 10 pages that they're probably going to murder somebody in order to get the heart that will match. Um, and the ways in which Tijian and Grosjean can draw on their traditions, can draw on their culture in order to um, resist evil, in order to possibly affect a positive change in this dystopia. Oftentimes, I think we think of um, dystopia as, as they're so negative. <laughs> there, there's a, a sense of hopelessness. There, there's resistance, but ultimately this crumbling resistance in the face of the totalitarian power of dystopia. Here we see uh, a somewhat different story and, and one that doesn't necessarily end happily for everybody, but we see a, a ways in which um, characters are drawing on their culture, drawing on their tradition in order to affect a, a more positive world around them. And so that aspect was really interesting. It's it's a book that is violent at times, graphically violent at times, as we see the, the real evil of characters um, there in that core in central Toronto where there is no system to protect anyone and so might makes right. Um, and, and so we see that, but, but there is a real, uh, it is interesting to see the positive aspects of community that sort of spring up from those who are there. And I found the book to be, as I said, it was very thrilling, um, but it was also interesting to, to be opening up into um, Hopkinson's culture, Hopkinson's world, and uh, learning so much from that. Uh, it, it reminded me at times of the way that Zora Neale Hurston, she sort of separated her, her cultural ethnographies and, and anthropology where she was looking at her own ancestral culture, um, and, and generally even there within um, Florida and New Orleans, uh, but, but she sort of separated that from her fiction, but here it's combined and fused very well. It also reminded me of uh, the great P. Shelley Clark, who I think is, is another writer who sort of draws on Afro-Caribbean traditions to um, build up and amplify the science fiction, steampunk horror works he's working with. Uh, I was reminded as well of Octavia Butler um, in, in a sort of a way where I feel like Butler might have been an influence on Hopkinson. Um, she certainly was someone who was praising Hopkinson. She's quoted here on the cover of this volume. And I was reminded of uh, Derek Walcott. He is, uh, he was a huge influence, I think, on Hopkinson. She sort of acknowledges that influence. His play, Tijan and his, and, uh, his brothers, is referenced at multiple times in epigraphs across the novel. And so I just, I thought all of it worked really well. I'm curious to read more by uh, Neil Hopkinson, possibly um, The Salt Roads, possibly some other work. It'll be what I can find. Um, one last note is that while Hopkinson is queer, that wasn't a central component of the book, uh, but she, she did something interesting. This book was written in uh, 1998, where it's, uh, there are multiple side characters who are queer. And um, the ways in which she just sort of builds that up as a natural part of this environment. And it's not just in that central core of Toronto that's been cut off where people can be free to be who they are. But we see that at, across Canada, that's also true. And so that aspect of her identity was sort of allowed to be within the book, even if it wasn't a central part of the book. Um, but I'd be curious to know if there are other uh, readers who have enjoyed this book specifically, or if there are other works from Hopkinson that you would really encourage me to read. Uh, I certainly enjoyed this one. Thanks.